on Memorial Day weekend, 1984. Two students, Sabah and Barish, studied all night for a final test. They wanted to put the books aside and go for a drive and have some breakfast. Approximately 3.50 to 4 a.m., the two students arrived at a gas station. They pulled up to a self-service pump. Someone came out to serve them, which they thought was uh, unusual. They were explicitly told not to go into the store and uh, asked what they wanted. The student who was driving specifically asked for $5 in fuel and gave this attendant five $1 bills. The other student wanted cigarettes and gave him, I believe, a $5 bill. The attendant returned to the store to retrieve the cigarettes, came back out. The cigarettes came to $1 exactly, which was also odd and four $1 bills were returned to the student. And all of a sudden, they noticed wet blood transferring from this person's hands. Immediately, they, in their words, decided they better get the hell out of there. They stopped about five or six miles down the road at the next phone booth. Within five minutes, two officers arrived. A person was laying in a pool of blood bound with a wire behind his back. He was deceased. The victim had been stabbed with a foot-long screwdriver that penetrated through his upper chest. There was a large cast iron bell, appeared to be hit in the side of the head with that and had a skull fracture from that. The coup de gras was a large soda canister that would weigh probably in the neighborhood of 40 pounds that was used to crush his skull. A wallet in his back pocket had a driver's license ID. It was quite traumatic for the officers because both officers had known the victim personally. In fact, everyone in Brigham City knew Brad Perry. The two students from the gas station, Sabah and Barish, they were brought in for questioning. They had a police sketch artist who attempted to sketch the attendant that they saw come out and serve them as they were there at the gas station. Sabah became frustrated with the sketch artist's inability to capture what he believed he saw. He's quite a good artist, and he actually sketched two sketches. They were very consistent with their description of the suspect's eyes. And they talked about the emptiness looking into those eyes and how dark they were. Later on that evening, officers traveling on Highway 89 noticed a male walking southbound who'd matched the description of the suspect that the students provided. When the officers stopped Mr. Ellsworth, they noticed blood, not only on his shirt, but on his hands. Their thought was, we've got the suspect. They bring in the students who witnessed the person come out and pump the gas. Neither student said that Mr. Ellsworth was the person that came out and pumped the gas. Everything was combed and recombed and combed again. We needed, at the very least, a witness or some evidence that would vector to a particular person. 
but the case was just largely at a dead end. It was a cold case. At that time, I didn't feel anything but discouragement. Thank heavens, that's where Amy came in. I wanted to try to do as much as I could for this case and for the Perrys to give them some peace. I sat down with Scott Cosgrove. I asked him, have we tested all the evidence that we have for DNA? And he told me no. At that point in time, DNA testing was in its very beginning stages in the state of Utah. Um, and they were pretty parsimonious with their willingness to test things. We had to go to our county commission to get some additional funding, and Amy facilitated those additional funds. The results from the DNA testing are reported to us. All of the DNA-related evidence was Brad Perry's blood. It was incredibly discouraging for me, frankly. We didn't really have anything to be able to move forward on a trial. And that's when I remember there's one last thing to be rejected. The blood on the dollar bill. A month or two went by and that's when I received the call We have a DNA hit on the bloody dollar bill, and it belongs to a Glenn Griffin. So I immediately did all the research on who is this guy. Mr. Griffin at the time was in federal custody in Lompoc, California, serving time for operating a clandestine meth lab. He'd been in and out of jail and prison for almost all of his adult life. We immediately get a hold of Griffin's probation records so we can start to build a sense of, of who his friends are, who his family are. We're driving over the hill to Hiram, not far from Brigham City. That's where Glenn's parents live. I meet with them and I just ask them to tell me about Glenn. The mother said that they had problems with him. As he grew up, he was acting out, stealing money out of the till at the store, harming animals. And I asked for photos of him in 1984 to compare it with a suspect sketch. It was an exact match. However, I was convinced that Glenn didn't do this alone. And I asked who he associated with, and she said that he was always with his buddy, Wade Mon. Okay, so we got your permission to, to record this. Yeah, you go ahead and do that. Okay. And that's when we said, Wade, this is about the murder of Brad Perry in 1984. This is the crime we're talking about. Oh, my God. Wade, I, I can't express this enough. You've got to be open and honest with us. You know, I did. I do remember it as. Wade was at the station with Glenn, and they got in an argument with Brad over beer. The dispute arose over change that uh, Mr. Griffin was supposedly entitled to. Glenn went berserk. It became violent. It escalated into a physical altercation in the front of the store. As that's occurring, the students show up out front Glenn goes out. At that point, Brad was still alive. 
Glenn comes back inside the gas station. Brad is taken in the back. Glenn tortured him. And then he killed Brad Perry. And I says, Wade, I understand a lot of that. It's being truthful. However, there's no way Glenn did this on his own. And he said this, and I'll never forget it. That was on the guy's leg. He was holding him, holding him legs. Holding him down. All I did was help tie him up and keep him down. He said, once Glenn goes off, I can't stop it. Were you scared of Glenn? Yeah. Okay. Real scared. Even though Wade Mon was granted immunity, he nevertheless refused to testify. At this point, we know we have substantial evidentiary problems. We need to look at what do we have that could help us place Mr. Griffin at the gas station. We still had the hairs that were found around the crime scene. As we're proceeding to trial, the opportunity came up to have the mitochondrial DNA test, which was a brand new technology, had never been used in the Utah court. And we were able to compare the hairs with Mr. Griffin's DNA. And we have a DNA match. That, to me, made an absolutely ironclad, unanswerable case. He might be able to explain why his blood was on the dollar bill. He might have been able to explain why his hairs were in that store. He certainly could not explain both of them at the same time, together with the drawing, in a way that was anything other than he, in fact, murdered Brad Perry. Mr. Griffin's friend, Wade Mon, was tried, and the jury found him not guilty. That was a grave disappointment to me, but I respect the jury's uh, role in this case. <laughs> 